Hello, and welcome to the Hank Sisko Show. My name is Stan Husky. I'm your guest host for the day. Uh, I've been trying to fill in for Hank as best I can, but as everybody knows, there's really no fill in for Hank Sisko. Uh, but I have somebody on the show today that is uh, going to cover a topic that is uh, just infinite. I believe it's the history uh, of Montgomery County. Uh, maybe not infinite. Maybe that's too strong of a <laughs> word. Uh, but certainly a broad enough topic that we could talk for a couple hours here. Sure. But I'm only going to keep you for about a half an hour. Our guest today is Barry Rawhauser. Rawhauser. Correct. I, I got, got that it, right. Yeah. Very nice. I didn't even think about it until just <laughs> now, and I thought, oh no, what if I get that wrong? But Barry, thanks for being on the show today. No um, we were just talking a little bit uh, off camera about uh, what you sometimes think are, are things that are just set in stone that everybody knows about them and that well written, documented. Um, uh, but there are quite a few things that, that you almost have to talk to people to get the history about. And one of them was the uh, uh, book that I did, Images of Modern America, on, on Elmwood Park Zoo. I was very surprised to find uh, a very little written history about the zoo. Um, and, and that amazed me. Um, and you were talking about another um, uh, well, topic? Well, I mean, I can say uh, there are lots of topics in uh, the history of Montgomery County that we find problematic to study because, uh, you know, we, um, we, we aren't as good about keeping records as we'd like to think we are. Uh, you know, in the, when you're in the process of running a company or running a business, running a hospital, anything like that, tons of paperwork everywhere, mm -hmm. and you think this history will be preserved forever, uh, the reality is so much of that gets thrown away and tossed away that the records that, that exist you know, 50 years later, 100 years later, are sometimes very, very tiny. And particularly when you get into the trying to research 20th century history especially, um, we find that there really aren't very many records. And so uh, one of the projects that, that we've been undertaking over the past couple of years is looking at uh, oral history, uh, interviewing people from the community. Uh, this is especially true when you're looking at issues like uh, immigration, uh, when you're looking at uh, race and things like that, subjects which are uh, no one thought to really write a lot about. Uh, now we can go back and interview people and find out what happened in the, the 1940s, the 1950s, the 1960s. As long as someone lived through that area, era, uh, they've got um, hopefully good enough memories that they can recall things that, that you're just not able to get anywhere else. Sure. And so they really do become important. And that was the part of the problem with the zoo book. The zoo was started in 1924. Yeah. Uh, and not a lot of people around from that time that were old enough, I guess, to even right. be able to talk about it or remember it. Um, but, but you're the, the, the executive director of the Historical Society of Montgomery County, so you've got to cover a bigger, uh, bigger scale than that. We, so we try to cover, the, our county, uh, Montgomery County, was split off from Philadelphia County in 1784, and we really try to collect as much as we can from 1784 to today. Uh, you know, if a big prominent business closes tomorrow, we want to see if we can get some of their records or some of their information. If we find out a business we didn't know about that opened up in 1784, we try to get their records too. So, right. so it is a, a long history and it really varies what kinds of things uh, are available. Uh, and it is a big, it's, you know, you say it about being infinite, but it really is. In, in many ways it is infinite because uh, there are these big businesses, these big industries, these important people. But then there's also the histories of the everyday person. And when you start adding that all up, it can be voluminous. Uh, and that's one of the challenges with a lot of historical societies like ours, is that many of us are just running out of space. Uh, sure. You know, we really do have a, an issue with trying to figure out how to hold all that material and also make sure that it's accessible, that the public knows about it, and that, uh, and that people become more interested in it. One of the things uh, I, I found fascinating when I, I wrote um, uh, the Norristown book, mm -hmm. um, and I don't think they do them anymore, you were talking about businesses coming and going, uh, was I found this Sanborn map. Oh, uh, yeah. And mm -hmm. you, you know the name Sanborn. Sure. Well, they, they um, plotted every single business that was in Norristown at the time. And this map, I think, was from, uh, I want to say, 1840s or somewhere in there. What mm -hmm. I found really interesting was Markley Street did, like, stopped. Uh, at the edge of where the Times Herald building is and didn't go across the creek right there. Right, um, right. So if you wanted to go, you had to go around and go down to where the uh, bridge was at Elm. Yeah, even just even really just looking at maps, you get a good sense of how the history of this county has changed dramatically over the years. Now that's, um, that's a, an identity of our history that we want to make sure that people are aware of, that we have been ever-changing. Uh, we've hardly been stagnant. And uh, you look at maps, you look at uh, city directories. City directories, another thing that might be disappearing in the near future. You know, sure. city directories were originally done in the, the 19th century to sort of keep track of where people lived. 
and then they turned into phone books, and now what good is a phone book anymore? <laughs> uh, they don't, they don't make as much them. sense. So, right. so that's going to be a challenge in 100 years from now is how do we figure those things out. Uh, but you know, all of those pieces of information come together to tell you this great story. And, and the, the word we like to use for Montgomery County is the word mosaic. Uh, we think we've got this incredibly diverse identity, not only in terms of the, the people who live here and the, and the diversity of the people, uh, but also the, the socioeconomic world that they lived in, uh, the variety of craftsmanships, the variety of industries they get involved in, whether it's agriculture to major industries, uh, but also the fact that we are a county that is uh, very, you know, tends to be very rural to the north, but is butted up against one of the largest cities in America. Right. Uh, and so we've got a, a, an incredibly diverse uh, uh, identity. And so we've been really trying to run with this word mosaic to sort of help to help to identify ourselves to the people that move into this area, but also to identify ourselves to people who are interested in touring this area. And I might say even to identify ourselves to scholars that are interested in studying the development of America, because I, I do think that we have a lot to say about um, a lot of issues that America has been undergoing since the beginning of you know the time. Yeah, well, you were talking about with people new to the area. I'm sure they'd be surprised with with the King of Prussia being what it is today and Plymouth yeah. meeting Mall and all. I'm sure they'd be immensely surprised to know that Norristown was was the hot spot. Oh yeah, uh, back in the 50s and 60s, that that this was the place everybody came to to shop. Yeah. and to do everything. And on. that is not uncommon in all of America. Sure. I mean, that's a story that every town tells, and I just think we we do it pretty good here. I mean, when when you know many towns might complain that the malls kind of uh, made their cities and towns get smaller. We're a town that had one of the, has, has one of the largest malls, you know, in terms of square footage of business. Uh, so we really do have a big story to tell. Absolutely. Uh, you know, and, you know, there's certainly a lot of other components to our history, uh, but um, it really is that identity of just being, uh, struggling with all these issues and making the most of it uh, and really being prosperous uh, in, in the long run. We're talking about a big story to tell. I, I don't know if everybody knows watching, but you're over on DeKalb Street in Norristown mm -hmm. uh, in not a huge building. Um, mm -hmm. And we were talking a little bit off camera as well about some of the, the challenges that you have being in that small space. You had, um, you had an event, you said, where you had like 65 people show up. That's a pretty good yeah, size we crowd. Had, uh, you know, for us, 65 is a lot. Uh, we run out of parking after about 30. Right. <laughs> and so, uh, you know, we're, we're still located. We, you know, we used to be located, uh, you know, our organization got started in 1884, in, uh, and we were located originally in downtown Norristown. We actually were in the old borough hall. Uh, they renamed it and called it Historical Hall for many, many years. Uh, then in the 1950s, they decided they were going to expand the courthouse, uh, which meant that they were going to you know, claim that space back. So then we uh, built where we currently are on DeKalb Street, 1654 DeKalb Street, which we built that house uh, or that building in 1953. It's on the it, part of the building is actually on uh, on the foundation of an old house that was once there. Uh, and we've been there ever since, since 1953. We did a small expansion in 2000. Uh, we probably outgrew the building in about 1963. <laughs> uh, and, you know, that's not a, a problem that most, every historical study really sort of deals with that issue of how much can you, how big can you really get, uh, and how much space do you really need to keep all of these records. Uh, but, yeah, we, we've undergone a, um, a strategic planning session over the past year, and one of the big decisions we made was that we really are, we really have outgrown our building. Uh, we've outgrown the parking, we've outgrown the storage, uh, we've outgrown the meeting space. Uh, we don't have enough space even for some of our volunteers to, to perform the duties that they like to do. So, so that's been uh, our new challenge moving forward is trying to figure out exactly how to solve those issues. Uh, and, and also how to transform ourselves and transform the identity of Montgomery County history. Well, and you're in a unique situation, and even though we're in a digital world, uh, the things that you are, are putting yeah. on display, we well, can't do digitally. You, we, you had, know, we had a, a great class last night on genealogy, and the, the woman who taught it, uh, Sydney Cruz Dixon, uh, her line to someone was, uh, genealogy is really great, but don't expect to be able to do it in your robe and your slippers. Uh, you really do have to get out there, and historical societies especially, uh, but any archival uh, place that holds a lot of archival holdings will tell you that not everything will ever be digitized. Uh, you know, there are certain records out there that, that digitization is fairly easy and fairly uh, simple to do, but there's a wealth of other material out there that because of its structure just will never ever get digital sure. uh, and, and that never turn into that easy to find on the web component. So you really do have to go out to places like us to find those things. Now, 
the one nice thing about the digital pr products that are out there and, and the digital world is that people learn about us through those digital worlds and we find many people want to come in and see the authentic product. Uh, you know, it's one thing to go and find the deed to your house online and see it uh, in black and white. It's another thing to come in and hold this 30 pound deed book and see this original de deed in this beautiful script and to read the original words and sort of get that feel of history. Uh, so we, we always feel that, that that's really important. Uh, it's important to us as, as historians and collectors of these things, uh, but we know it's important to our patrons as well. So when they visit, we try to make as much stuff as, as accessible as possible. So we, we try to do both. We try to balance it both. We try to digitize the world. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's not simple. How do you digitize a tall case clock, for example? How do you digitize a beautiful painting? Sure. It's not easy, uh, and uh, it takes a lot of work. But we've been working hard at getting some more products available for people so that they can sit in their robe and slippers and, and do their genealogy or find the history of their house. But in the long run, we know that we are always going to have to have a physical presence to be able to have that authentic experience for people. Well, and that's, that's I hate to use the phrase wow factor, but that is the wow is. factor. To yeah. be able to come in and see it yeah. uh, is a lot different than looking at it on your, your we, laptop. We hear it every day. Uh, you know, we have people come through and I think if they found uh, a note in a notebook that said, I am related to this person, that's one wow factor. But the other wow factor, and, and much bigger for them, is when they find a document that's handwritten in 1824 that explains it uh, because it was related to a court case or something like that. Just, we, we hear it every day. Uh, and that wow factor is important. It's what, I think it's what makes people appreciate history. In fact, I, you know, when we were going through the strategic planning process, that was how we started our whole process. We went around the room and had each person tell us uh, what was that one wow moment that you had that made you realize how important history and objects or, or archives, why they were so important to you. And so, um, you know, after going through that, you really realize just how important and how life-changing that can be for some people. It, it was for me, you know, oh, sure. in terms of how I did things. I can see a picture of, of the baseball that Hank Aaron hit his 714th home run with, but to see it in person is a, a completely different ball game. You know, for, for me it was, game, was uh, yeah. <laughs> for me it was Hank would have been proud of that, yeah, by the way. <laughs> uh, for me it was, uh, uh, my grandfather passed away and I remember uh, being at a church for the service and uh, walking around out in the graveyard. He was actually not, not buried in this graveyard, I was buried, buried somewhere else, but I was walking around the graveyard next to the church where we had the services, and I found a tombstone there for a Heinrich Rawhauser who came to America in 1749, and then it was a little plaque there that said, the first Rawhauser ever in America. And I was like, wow, and I, my, I went in and asked my grandmother, she had no clue. She had, <laughs> been, she had been going to this church for you know, 30, 40 years, had no clue that these uh, gravestones were out there. And so that, that started me on the process. I started uh, learning about all the people in that community. This is where I grew up in York County. Uh, but I just found it beautiful. And, and to me, even you know, here in Montgomery County, where I may not have my genealogy located here, I still love more than anything going back and finding the histories of individual people that you may or may not have ever heard of in your life. Uh, I think people have uh, you know, the day-to-day the, the -day guy that's doing his job and running a little store and living his life. Uh, those are stories which are beautiful, and when you can find the original documents that, that start to lay out that life, it's wonderful. And when you can do it for someone who they are descended from that person, that's when you really start seeing the connections. So that was kind of your first little bug that bit you for, yeah. for history? It was, uh, it was cemeteries. Uh, so we were, we were talking a little bit earlier about, um, uh, and I think this was off camera as well, but um, uh, minor league baseball. Mm -hmm. So is there any particular facet of history, like I'm, I'm really into like Civil War history. Mm -hmm. Is there any facet of history that you kind of attracts you the most? So the two biggest things for me, uh, one is certainly cemeteries. Uh, I love uh, graveyard art and I love sort of the stories of, of how cultural shifts like that happen. And one of the things we, we take care of as part of the Historical Society of Montgomery County is we own and maintain Historic Montgomery Cemetery, which is just at the edge of Norristown and in, in, it's actually in West Norton Township. Uh, and that has a, that's a, a very unique place. It's got about 6,000 burials there, five Civil War generals, about 400 and some odd uh, Civil War veterans. So I love places like that because they're physical and tangible. Uh, now for me, the other part that's always been really important is historic architecture. Uh, I'm an avid bicycle rider. So I ride, and that's one of the other reasons I got into history, was I would ride around for 30 or 40 miles, and I might see over the course of that time seven, eight, nine, ten historic homes, uh, beautiful historic homes, and I wanted to know more about, about them, uh, just from the looks, like what kind of house is that, what does it look like, when was it built, what does it tell you about the people who grew up there? 
And so those are really, those are the things I'll stop my car and get out a camera and go take a picture of, or get off my bicycle and take a picture of. Uh, much to the dismay of all my friends who are riding along with me, because I make them all stop while I take the picture. <laughs> um, well, that just made me think of um, uh, downtown Norristown. A beautiful you know, architecture in downtown Norristown. Beautiful I, architecture. Very uh, under, I mean, I can say underappreciated. I, I bet you a lot of people do appreciate it, uh, but it goes very much, I think, uh, under the radar. You know, not a lot of people talk about it, but beautiful architecture. So as old as Norristown is, though, you mm -hmm. see very little... Um, uh, I want to say colonial architecture. Yeah, we weren't big in colonial. I mean, our our town, our city, wasn't uh, didn't really see its growth until you get a little bit later, uh, and that's why you see the types of architecture we have. You know, these Victorian homes, these larger chateau esque buildings, and the Italianate villa uh, villa style. Uh, so you see that those kinds of styles, uh, and that's because that's when. To, to form that architecture, you usually need money, uh, and you usually need people moving into your area, and that was really one of the big growth spurts of Norristown was in that uh, you know, mid to late 19th century time period. So a big part of history is sometimes there's some revisionist history. So mm -hmm. uh, I'd, I'd read before, and I think I found this in, in an article somewhere, that one of the reasons you don't see a lot of colonial is that when General Howe came through here on his way to Philadelphia, the British general, mm -hmm. that he burned half of Norristown down. Yeah, it could have. I mean, there's, um, I don't know how much was here, you know, in terms of the number of houses. Um, possibly. But, but I think, uh, you know, in terms of the surviving buildings, it, it really does show that our growth period was, was during that time. Right. Well, there's a there's a house at Cherry and uh, Maine that they they claim is like the original one of the original mm -hmm. um, uh, homes in in Norristown. Mm -hmm. And if you look, it's that old colonial yeah, stone. Yeah. When, when you look at the the maps, uh, the very early maps, there's not a lot here in um, in like the 17th set. There's just not not a lot. Uh, we we do see a few few homes that are in the area. Um, they were just starting to put mills along the river. Yeah, and, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, but, you know, there are still great examples of that type of architecture throughout the county. Uh, and we do cover the whole county. So we have everything from uh, the mid-17th century all the way up through uh, today, really. When you, when you look at that, we have a few homes from the 1930s that are constructed, which are uh, fairly well known. So, uh, so we've got a, a big span. Some of the mansions on Main Street are, are unbelievable as yeah. well, and, and up to Calb Street. Uh, those are a little newer, but mm -hmm. uh, there are some older ones on Main Street that are And then you've got amazing. a whole other world of industrial complexes. So the, uh, the Scheidt Brewing Company uh, was yeah. here, and a beautiful architecture, and uh, clever uh, and interesting, and really, really fun to look at when you, when you really do examine it. So, so you, you've got a big mixture of things. So it, it really is, it's very rare that you have a county where you can find that 17th century stuff, at least in the mid-Atlantic region. You get to New England and you see a little bit more of it because they, they started earlier. Uh, but here to find that architecture so early uh, and surviving examples of it, and then to go all the way up through uh, a variety of time periods is, is right. great. So. Well, you were talking about, obviously, the whole county. Mm -hmm. um, I believe they, there was consideration when, when the county was first established that they were thinking about making Pottstown the county seat. Yeah, there was, uh, there was a discussion about Pottstown, because uh, it's a river town, it's got industry. Uh, the other one would, would have been Center Square, too. Uh, that was on the, the slate for a while because it's Center Square. It was the center of the county. Right. Uh, but it became Norristown. Norristown was another sort of river town. It was important in trade, important in industry. Uh, water power alone was one reason why this, mm -hmm. this area would have been important along the school kill. Uh, so, you know, the, 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 uh, the origins of Norristown as being that county seat, I think, come because there were just enough people living here that could advocate for it. Uh, but then also uh, there was a donation of land from University of Pennsylvania uh, who donated an, a number of acres in exchange for I think it was like 12 acorns a year. Uh, and so they, they gave us the land. In exchange, we were supposed to give them, I think, 11 or 12 acorns per, per year. I'm not sure why. Uh, and I'm, I think and are we, we still giving them those acorns? I think acorns? we probably owe them. <laughs> I don't think we've been giving them to, for quite some time. Uh, but it was. It was sort of an exchange. It was sort of saying, here, here's sort of this token gift you can give us. Uh, and so they were the ones that uh, originally gave the land to form um, the central area of Norristown. That's uh, right down by the courthouse. Right, right. Where the, the park is, right. and that's supposed to remain a park. And, right, right. Yeah. So what are some of the other, other big historic spots across the county? What, what would you consider some of the more fascinating or more uh, outstanding? So I think that for me personally, uh, as I go around, uh, you know, Valley Forge, part of Valley Forge is still in Montgomery County, so I think that is one that, you know, as visitors, when they come in, they like to uh, see that. Um, 
I certainly think that Norristown is one that uh, gets overseen as in terms of its importance historically in this area. The fact that it does become the county seat, the fact that it sees this growth. Um, for me, personally, because I like, uh, I tend to like rural historic architecture, I can drive around anywhere in this county and see beautiful uh, architecture from, from the rural areas. Um, I think that uh, another sort of important part of historically in this region is the Schuylkill River, all along mm. the Schuylkill River. Uh, so whether you're looking at Pottstown, whether you're looking at Phoenixville, whether you're looking at Norristown, whether you're looking at Bridgeport, uh, all of those areas throughout really tell this amazing story uh, of our region because it is what really creates the growth uh, up and down the river. I think the school kills uh, really becomes a, the heart of a great big story uh, and you know it's got its own organization devoted to it but uh, it really does tell a great story about why Montgomery County becomes so important. And there were lots of, north. along the Schuylkill oh, sure, that it. ran all the way out to past Reading, I believe. Yeah, yeah. Um, that was how commerce, you know, back in the yeah. day, that's where they moved it. Uh, you know, before trains, um, you know, traffic was slow on the roads. Uh, horse traffic, carriage traffic was a, uh, you know, a several mile a day. You know, you weren't, you know, now it's easy to go 60 miles an hour. Right. Uh, back then, not so easy. You know, conditions of roads, conditions of rivers were, were nearly... Uh, always get, got in your way, but a river could haul a lot of people and a lot of goods, and so it really does become a lot of that important trade. We don't use it that way anymore. Um, we haven't since 1837, you know, when the, when the trains first start coming in, it becomes kind of secondary, but in terms of formation, uh, you know, we have this, uh, this idea in history called uh, the germ theory or the seed theory, and it's that, that these very early things really create an identity for you later. And so uh, even though that, that focus of the river is being an important transportation thing, I think it still does this good job of sort of narrating a story for the county. Uh, I think just the, in the same way, I think our early diversity, uh, the fact that we are seeing uh, Quakers coming in here, we're seeing uh, folks of Germanic background moving in here, uh, and then we, we continue that, that idealism uh, of this diversity throughout, over the years, and we appreciate it in different ways. So I think that those early things that happen, even though they're so long ago, and we don't use it that way or we don't do that way, it really does impact us uh, down the road. So yeah, I'd love to see some development along the river. I, we have a miles and miles of waterfront, we don't use it, and a lot of, a lot of river towns really take advantage of that as, as yeah. a tourist destination. Uh, well, it, it, in many ways it is. I mean, when you think about it, we have the, uh, the Schuylkill River Trail. Uh, that gets, what, 800,000 users a year? So I think there are a lot of people using it as a tourist device. I think that it still has a ways to go yet in terms of being developed. I think you'll see it. I mean, um, uh, I went for a ride the other day down the trail, down through Conshohocken, mm -hmm. and you got to admit, some of that growth uh, is happening fast. Oh, uh, sure. And, and it's really changing, uh, especially the southern, you know, the, the parts as you get close to Philly, that it's really changing right. that part of the county. Right, it uh, seems like it's coming out of the city and just... I think we'll see it soon. Uh, you know, there, I think the... Um, the identity of Norristown has a good chance of changing quickly uh, as, uh, as, as our demographics within the county begin to change. As people start commuting from this area down to the city to work and vice versa. Uh, and I think as you see uh, younger people wanting different things in housing, uh, you know, I think that that might change as well. And that, that might uh, re-identify uh, what Norristown is, and you'll see some of that development. Uh, well, maybe you guys could find a big building along the river there. You could move in down there and tell that story it because is that story one is of not the told. ideas on my. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it is. It's so certainly something we've been thinking about. Uh, you know, as I rode down the the Schuylkill River Trail the other day, I I kept seeing buildings, and I thought, boy, we'd look we'd look good there. Right. <laughs> we'd look good there, uh, and uh, it's always hard to predict what's going to happen in 20 years. Uh, but you know, that area along the river is really really going to change, I think, and uh, it'll be uh, interesting to see how that, that is and, and be interesting to see how we fit into that. Well, I think that, that history does need to be told because if you look at the Schuylkill today, you can't imagine large barges going up and down that no. thing. It's, it just seems too shallow in no. a lot of places. Yeah, and it, it's, uh, uh, you know, like I said, it's, it's, that, I, it's that one of those formative years of, of what we do here in the, the county and, and uh, because it does transfer most of the county, uh, it really is, really is critical. Now, Having said that, there's also another part of our county that, that also is on the other side that, that we have to make sure that we tell that story too. So, so it, it's... Wait, where's that? What, uh, well, what? Uh, I'm talking about, you know, as you move further east and you get further away from the school kill. Okay. Uh, so we have to tell that part of that story too. So anything from the, 
uh, Wincote and Cheltenham and these are early towns that are forming that are formed by uh, wealthy people from Philadelphia coming out to the suburbs. That's a story we have to tell. Uh, we have to tell stories of, of the agricultural part of, of Montgomery County, that northern part that's still there, that people are still doing some farming. Uh, Governor Pennypacker, we've got to do all these different things. Uh, First Speaker of the House, lived in tribe. Yeah, so yeah, so <laughs> it gets complicated. Uh, so trying to kind of focus on all of those different things uh, really becomes a challenge for us. We, we try to focus on uh, we're one of the only historical societies in the county that, that our job is to focus on the entire county. Uh, so even finding a home for us that's centralized is difficult. We, we're pretty sure we're going to stick to the Norristown, West Norton, East Norton kind of area because that's still fairly centralized and we'd like to stay close to uh, Norristown because it's the county seat. Uh, uh, but it is, it is a challenge. It's a big county uh, and uh, a lot of people and a lot of roads and a lot of history. Well, um, we would love to have you stay here in Norristown. I think it's a, it's a proper place for the Historical <laughs> Society of Montgomery County being the county seat. Um, this has been a great conversation. Uh, it went very, very quickly, so I'm, I'm surprised I'm getting the signal to wrap up here. One of the things that I, I often hear a lot is, is um, when are you guys open? And, and when can people come see you? What are your public hours? Sure. Uh, so we are open uh, Monday and Thursday from 10 till 5, and we're open on Tuesday and Wednesday from 1 to 8. So we've got two evenings that, that you can stop in. Uh, we're open the first Saturday of each month from 10 to 2. Uh, we, you know, our library and research uh, center is open that, that entire time. Uh, we've got uh, lectures uh, going on, and other presentations and workshops and classes. Uh, those are available on our website. That's h, uh, hsmcpa.org, so our initials plus PA, because there's a lot of Montgomery counties in, in America. Um, and then also, um, the cemetery is there, Historic Montgomery Cemetery. Uh, you can go visit that anytime you want. There are signs there that sort of guide you around and tell you about some of the important people that are buried there. Well, um, we went over that real fast. So the five Civil War generals buried in the same spot. It's yeah. Good. It's pretty amazing right it, there it's, by it's itself. It's fantastic. And, and we do have a lot of visitors there. Uh, and we, we're doing a big uh, celebration. Uh, we do a big Memorial Day observance on May 25th from 11 to 1. Uh, but, you know, yeah, it's... it's uh, there's always something going on. Mm -hmm. uh, May is a very, very busy month for us. We've got a lecture on the 16th on Philadelphia National Cemetery, which has a large number of U.S. colored troops buried there. We've got a lecture on May 21st, which is about the First Great Awakening. Uh, we've got our Memorial Day celebration. June thir uh, on June 13th, we've got a, a, an event at the cemetery. So, a lot of history uh, So about. definitely check our website out and uh, you know, become a member. Uh, and if you happen to own one of those beautiful buildings along the Schuylkill River Trail in Norristown, and you want to give it to us, give me a call. <laughs> <laughs> well, give me your phone number real quick. Uh, uh, our phone number is 610-272-0297. Uh, Excellent. Um, and you can always email me uh, at barryr at hsmcpa.org. Excellent. So, Barry, thank you so much for well, being on you. the show today. Thanks. And thank you very much for watching. And for my good friend, Hank Sisko, keep bobbing and weaving.